Okay, our last presentation this evening will be Larry Schofield on concrete pavement surface characteristics. He's from ACPA and the IGGA, and he promised to answer the question from the composite pavement technologies with one of his uh, slides. Thank you very much. Take all the time you want. We're cutting into their drinking. I'm going to try and abbreviate it on the fly for you. The last thing I want to do is steal a half hour of your happy hour. Who was who the one who asked the question on the thin overlays? He's gone. He's a coward. Just, just to give you some background, I'm from uh, Mesa, Arizona, which is a suburb of Phoenix, and I help cover up the Phoenix freeway system. So what I'm going to show you, I'm one of the people that you can throw rocks at for how it performed. Maybe this is going to be a really short presentation. Okay, I think we're ready to go. I'm going to buzz through some of this stuff, trying to figure out if I can do this in 15 minutes, so we'll have to see how this works. Um, I'm going to try and just explain some of the surface characteristics as we go, talk about grinding and grooving, and at the end we're going to talk about different uh, lab tests and, and field results. Um, normally when we talk about surface characteristics, we're talking about smoothness and safety and noise. And what I want to emphasize is the only thing we're going to talk about is really what you'd call safety, and the emphasis there is going to be on friction. The document is Mark Snyder in the audience. I haven't seen him, but um, that's probably one of the best documents I've ever seen done on surface characteristics. So I want to get a plug in for uh, Mark just so you know it's, that it exists. And we always want to talk about innovation. I'm not picking on anybody, but most of the stuff that was really innovative was done a long time ago. Kurt mentioned the Belfontin uh, project in 1893. It's 126 years old today. Notice it's got a 4x4 four four texture because with horse, horse hooves, you have to go both directions. So people have been thinking about this for a long time, and it goes back even farther. If you look at the one on the right, um, that's what is now today Turkey. And we don't know when those grooves were made, but from the structures that were there, it was somewhere between the 5th and 10th century B.C. So people have been worrying about these things for a long time. This is my shameless shot at um, asphalt, but it's really a segue into friction testing. And notice that road. I was out there last week at a state, and they actually have an accident location. And what they think was happening there is that it's actually they were losing traction going up the hill, just like I did today when I ended up in a ditch, except I was on snow and they're on water. I think what they really had going on there was a hydroplaning project. Or problem, and what I want to—the reason I bring that up—is the friction tests, in my opinion, do not address hydroplaning. It's a different issue, so that's that's the message I'm trying to get there. When you're hydroplaning, you don't have any control, and the friction tests um, don't represent that. There's typically four different types of friction testers. The ASTM lock wheel skid trailer is the one that we use here in the United States, outside of Arizona, where I'm from. Most states that test friction use that. And it's just like in the fun days when before we had ABS brakes, when you jam on the brakes, it skids the tire. And if you do it on a wet road, you can actually do donuts on the interstate if you're not real careful. So it comes from the late 60s. The fixed slip was developed to represent ABS brakes. Um, so it has about a 15 to 20 percent slip range. Variable slip is the same device, except I can change the amount of slip, and so it gives me choices. And side force is I actually mount the tire sideways and drive forward with it. So I measure the lateral force. The reason that that's important, you notice the bottom three say continuous measurement. So I can measure all along the path with a lock wheel skid trailer because I am skidding for about a, uh, 90 to 180 feet. I'll wear out my tire pretty quick. So you usually only test every half mile to mile on a network. That's what one of them looks like. And if you, well, yeah, point down on your picture. Um, anyway. If you look at the orange bars down there, that's where the water is shooting out. The important thing here is it shoots a half a millimeter water in front of that tire. Remember I mentioned the difference between friction and hydroplaning? 
Also notice you have rib tires and smooth tires. Most agencies, about 35 state agencies, test with a rib tire. About six or seven do smooth tire only, but I'm going to show you why you need to do both. So this is um, a test from a, what is a half a millimeter of water looks like. If you look at the dime, it's half the thickness of a dime. And that's why I say friction tests typically don't represent um, hydroplaning. If you look on the water film thickness where that red dashed line is, that's showing you where the half a millimeter thickness, 0.02 inches. Those are rib tires shown with that red bar and a smooth tire. What it shows you is that, the, and this is my conjecture, so if anybody knows this, please speak up. My belief of why this value was picked at half a millimeter is notice that the rib tire doesn't really change as you increase water film thickness. However, if you're, if you're testing with a smooth tire, notice it's dramatically affected by water film thickness, and that's a pretty important point to remember. So some of the other devices, this is a grip tester. These are typically used on... Uh, highways and the reason I'll show you why um, you can see the test wheel is a 10 inch it's smooth but it's also bicycle chain technology I wouldn't use this on an airport it's a very good device it's continuous measurement but I doubt if it'd be very durable on a network I mentioned Arizona doesn't do the lock wheel skid trailer we use a runway friction tester so that's what one of those looks like again they're used on runways obviously um, there's only one of these devices called a scrim in the United States the Europeans don't like the lock wheel skid trailer so they do the scrim type devices. The difference is that's about an eight hundred thousand dollar device versus a hundred to two hundred thousand dollar device. Here's a poorer picture of it, but it's the only one I could see the angle. If you look at that red arrow, they actually have a tire that's mounted at about a twenty degree angle. So it measures continuously. It's a much narrower tire than ours. It's only four inches wide. All these devices give you a different value. So keep that in mind. It's all the test conditions. The test conditions on a lot of the European devices I'm showing you are one to two millimeters of film thickness instead of a half a millimeter film thickness. Um, two other devices, which are called static devices, and they will be shown in the research I'm going to show you later on is the DF tester, dynamic friction tester, and then the CT meter. These are developed in combination with each other, so they test the same circular path, and I'll show you that. Here's the problem with it. That's the little, there. notice those three little pads is what it skids on. So it's a very good device. It was developed in Japan by, um, for laboratory type testing and we've extended it to field testing. This has been used in Europe a lot, British pendulum tester, and I poo-poo on this every chance I get because researchers in this country all like to use it and they all come back and say, well, maybe we shouldn't have used that. So I apologize if anyone's testing aggregates with it. I'm just not a, a fan of it, but it is used so people can see what it is. I'm going to talk a little bit about longitudinal grooving and diamond grinding just to make sure you're aware of it. What you're looking at the top photo is a drag texture without grooving and the bottom one with grooving. It's pretty simple. The grooves are typically an eighth of an inch wide, eighth of a quarter inch deep, and three quarter inch centers. And that's pretty much standard across the country in most places. This happens to be my home in Mesa, Arizona, which is a suburb of Phoenix. And you can notice down there 143 days without rain. So I waited a long time to get this picture. This is all on the same road. It's about a mile, two miles from my house. It started raining. I ran out from the, with a camera and took pictures while I'm driving, which I should never admit to. That's the asphalt rubber friction course. Everybody thinks friction courses don't have splash spray. That's a longitudinal groove on it. The exact same, they're about 30 seconds to a minute apart in the pictures on the same segment. My point being is outside of digging the asphalt rubber uh, side, I'm also not covering splash spray and durability. I mentioned I was talking about friction, so I'm also not talking about hydroplaning either. And this is the question I said, why do you not want to use a thin one inch asphalt rubber friction course? Notice all the inch to two inch gaps between those lanes. Those joints are every 15 feet on a plane jointed. That cost about two to three hundred million dollars that you're going to have to put down every 10 years. And I went through two windshields in a period of five years from the chips. Those of you, you guys are a big uh, chip seal state. And what happens when your chip seals ravel? They ding your windshield and your paint job. So does ARFC when it ravels. It makes it's arguably the quietest pavement in the world when it's placed down at about 96, 98 decibels. It's average 102 right now, and what you're looking at right there is probably 105. So if you ask me why I wouldn't do it, it's not sustainable. And it also won't stand up on life cycle cost analysis. Nothing to do with my presentation. 
If you want to do a lot or learn a lot about longitudinal grooving, it was actually developed in California. There was other in the in the early 1960s, other studies in Texas, but California really brought it to fruition, and that's the source for it. So I want to point out a couple things, and I don't know how I'm going to do this. If you look at the two uh, longitudinally grooved astroturf, um, the yellow columns represent a rib tire and the blue columns represent a, the smooth tire for ASDM tires. If you'll notice, they're about both the same height. And when you have groove textures, that's what you'll see. A conventional texture, whether it be transverse tine, longitudinal tine, conventional diamond grinding, often will have a difference in the bar heights. If you look at the uh, CDG, conventional diamond grind, you'll notice that. And when you have longitudinal groove textures, which NGCS also has, you'll typically see those bar heights about the same. So I want to point that out as you look at other things. You don't have to read this. The thing I want to point, there's two studies that were done in the late 1960s in California. And California established a .095 groove width. And why I bring that up is everybody in this country does an eighth of an inch. I think it's um, California still has that spec, but I doubt if that's what they get for groove width if you're a contractor my industry wants to do it eighth inch wide because there's a lot more production on it. I think we need to go back and rethink the, to a 0.095 because I think they actually had it right. Um, if you look on the safety side of it, as you look down there, I don't know if you can read it, but 20% um, reduction in total accidents, 50% reduction in fatal accidents, and 70% in wet weather accidents. They did a, this is in the San Francisco, Los Angeles areas. These were big studies. The bad news is, Nobody does these studies anymore, so it's like hen's teeth trying to get this data. So the reason I'm showing you the old data is about the only data that's out there anymore. So this was a California State Route 58. Um, these are different textures. I won't go through there. The point I'll make here, if you look where those red diagonal arrows are, that's showing you the difference between grooved and ungrooved. And that's a pretty phenomenal difference in friction values. The light, lighter shades of each of those colors are the smooth tire, and the darker shades are the rib tires. So if you'll notice that one, it's got, I can't read it, 14 and a half skid number. So if you look over the far right where that red dash line is, that actually is what states that have smooth tire testing use as their intervention level. So that's a pretty bad number, and the reason for that, that's what that texture looks like. So there, that's almost void of macro texture. I'm a big fan of macro texture. And if you have a very bad macro texture, you'll see a very big benefit from longitudinal grooving. So one of the other things they looked at at this site, this was a bunch of test sections, was the effect of groove depth. So they did an eighth inch uh, deep and a quarter inch deep. And you can see the taller uh, blue columns or the rib tire and the shorter, the, the smooth. And then you have 2009 and 2013 testing. 2009 is actually Caltrans testing. 2013 was IgJ. But for all intents and purposes, there's no difference. So beyond eighth of an inch, again, remember, we're testing with a half a millimeter thickness of water. So the question would be, what if I had a two millimeter thickness of water? Would I get different results? We don't know the answer to that. That's what that section looks like. I love this slide because it's got some of the worst plastic shrinkage cracking I've ever seen. It's a very high truck route. It's doing very well. It's very smooth. Um, this one, the two uh, blue lines are showing you a grooved AstroTurf texture. One is ribbed and one is uh, a smooth tire. Notice the blue lines are pretty similar. The red lines represent an ungrooved, and notice how, diff how much difference there is between the uh, bald tire and the smooth tire. And what's important about this one, if you look at the bottom, it's at 40, 50, and 60 miles an hour. ASTM lock wheel skid trailer testing is done at 40 but this shows that that result is consistent even at higher speeds. I'm beating you to death with data, um, and I apologize, but again, if you look at the far left, the longitudinal time, look at the difference between the height of the two bars, and that's what you typically see with a lot of textures. When you have the groove textures, you'll see that they're closer together, and in this case, if you look at NGCS, you'll see the blue, which is the smooth tire, is actually higher. It does happen, it's not common, but that's one of the advantages of groove textures. This is the very last one, uh, I think. I'm just gonna show you these bars real quick. Again, what you're seeing between the light blue and the dark blue columns is pre-grooving and post-grooving. And look at the difference in the values. But also look, it's a very poor value to begin with, meaning it had almost no macro texture. 
And this is another one from Arizona. Always keep in mind what you're going to do for preservation. At this time, we were doing transverse tiny, uniformly spaced, and that's why we ended up covering up the freeway system to begin with. But we came in with longitudinal grooving as a safety measure. This was actually the noisiest outside of the random transverse tiny pavement that was the last test section we ever built before we covered it up. This was the noisiest pavement. So don't uh, remember that someday you're going to have to do something with it. Okay, so what I'm trying to show you here is that grooving has a dramatic effect on low macro texture surfaces. It always works, uh, and it has an impact on wet weather safety based on a lot of results from the old days. Diamond grinding, hopefully everybody here is familiar with it, but it's a corduroy texture. I just want to make sure you understand this part here is going to fit in with a lab test I'm going to show you. So when we stack ahead, what you have is a number of blades and a number of, number of spacers. The spacers will vary in width between 110 thousandths and 130 thousandths. So just be aware of that. Again, I'm just showing you. And the other thing I want to make sure you're aware of when we talk about lands, that's the area that actually goes in between the blades. So the wider the blade, the wider the land. Conventional wisdom says if I have wider lands, it's more durable and it lasts longer, i.e. will have higher friction. So remember that in the studies I'm going to be mentioning to you. Okay, there's two different studies for the laboratory studies. One was done by Texas, um, the University of Texas, and this was finished up in about 2013. In the beginning of the study, what they're really trying to do is look at different mixes with different types of manufactured sand. But to be able to do it in a laboratory, they said we've got to be able to evaluate friction in the laboratory because we don't want to have an adverse friction on, on friction on the roadway. So they actually developed the technique that you're going to see in both of these studies. And the other thing to uh, point out, they also did the testing, the lab testing for both of these studies. At the end of the Texas study, they also said, well, let's go on and look at the effect of different aggregate types with diamond grinding. And they did that also. And Alabama study is not yet completed. It's, uh, it's completed. It's still in draft uh, form of the report, so it's not published. But um, in Alabama, they don't want carbon and aggregate at the surface. So if you're an asphalt pavement, that's easy to fix with the wearing course. You put the high aggregate and the wearing course, and then you can do the carbon and aggregate and the rest of it. But if you're a concrete surface, that puts you at a disadvantage. So that's why they're looking at the blending of carbonate, non-carbonate aggregates. And then just like the Texas study, they also wanted to see is there an optimum pattern for grinding on these surfaces. Uh, this is just showing you that this is the usage of crushed aggregate in the United States for everything. And notice that everybody's got limestone aggregate, so it can work very well. Um, all aggregate is not created equal, nor is all uh, limestone aggregate. The graph on the right shows you the, the commodity prices of those products, and notice where people are interested in blending happens to also coincide with uh, where the high costs are. From an industry standpoint, when our contractors go out to figure out how to grind your job, they're doing a scratch test. It's called a Mohs hardness. And also, they're looking at the fines composition. So that's what we look at. Unfortunately, on neither of these studies was that done that I'm aware of. So that's one of the things that we can go back and try and fix. Um, but you can notice the, the limestones in the four, three to four range. Your fingernail is about a two and a half or three, just so you know, on scratch. So what uh, University of Texas developed was a procedure where they would cast a little slab about Two feet by two feet, I think they eventually got down to 20 inches by 20 inches and two to three inches thick. So that way they were small quantities. They could make the composition however they wanted. And we had a little grinding unit. This actually was the one that developed the next generation concrete surface. So they could put those little slabs underneath it. They could vary the blade width or the spacer width, excuse me. So you grind a little specimen and you go over here and you put it on a wheel tracking device. That was a mod modification of an NCAT device. And then you produce a little slab that looks like this. And the reason I have that in there, notice that little track that's on there. Now, if you go over to both the DF tester, remember I showed you those three little feet? They circle right around in that same footprint. So does the CT meter, which measures the macro texture. So what's cool about it, you get the tracking, and the first cycle would be 10,000. You'd do it, and then you'd come over here. You'd do the friction testing on it. Then you'd do the CT meter, so now you've got the macro texture measurement. And then you start it all over again. You do it at 40 cycles, 100,000, and they terminate at 160,000 cycles. This is what their results look like. So if you look, this is after 160,000 cycles. You're looking at the friction result as measured by the DF tester. And then if you see a P, that just means that's a drag texture. 
52 means that was 52 blades per foot. So that's equivalent to a 130 thousand spacer. 52G is the same blade with grooving. 60 means 110 width, uh, thousandths width spacers. 60G is grooved. And, and, and the last one is the next generation surface. So what their results are showing, each of those different colors on those columns are different mixtures, different combinations of silicious and, and limestone materials. And you can see the, it varies. The effect of blade width in their report suggests that the 130,000 spacer does have an advantage. And if you're a grinder, that's the cheapest thing to grind with. But if you'll notice, it's mix to mix dependent. And it's not much of an advantage, in, in my opinion. But that's what the results that report should be out shortly. Now let's go back to the Texas study, which was 2013. Let's just focus on these. Again, the vertical columns are showing you the different mix types and the legends on the right. And if you look at those two groups on the left between the 130 and 110 spacers, three of the five favor the 130 and two of the five favor the 110. So I don't think it's conclusive just yet. So IGJ also wanted to answer the same question ourselves because like I said, as a grinder, it's to our advantage to go, to go with wider spacers, but there's other issues that come into play. So there was test sections built by contractors in three different states. Um, this one happens to be in North Carolina, and you'll notice the spacers written across there. The yellow uh, columns represent rib tire. The blue columns rep represent the smooth tire. And notice in the middle of each of those bars, if you can read it, it says 40, 50, 60. So we tested it three speeds. So on this one, you could maybe squint a little bit and say the 130 is better, but I think it's a real hard call to say which of these is better or worse. Um, this is after three years. The bad news is we sold our uh, friction tester in 2015. So I can't tell you the end of the story, and that's really the important part of the story is what's it doing at five or seven years. But that's how research always goes. Um, so the other thing I'll mention on here is the variability of a ASTM lock wheel skid trailer is about two numbers. So don't get excited about one or two skid number differences. This, the other site, there's actually three sites. The second one was in Oklahoma. And again, you might be able to say this one might be a little more conclusive, but again, I think it's still um, a bit iffy on what it is. The last one was in Illinois, again, three years old. It, you can see, again, it's very hard to call a winner on this. So from the field test results that we have done, we haven't found that there's a difference. Um, and that's not necessarily good for us, but it also we use probably what I'd call moderate hardness aggregates. So the original experiment was to include very hard aggregate and very soft aggregate. The question is, these are all built by contractors out of their pockets, so that, that was the only three we could ever get built. So in summary, what I'm hoping, the yeah, message I've left you, that there's limestone aggregate used everywhere is very successfully. Um, if you have a macro texture problem that's significant, that uh, longitudinal grooving is, is probably your best bet, in my opinion. Um, both of these studies suggested that the CT meter, or the measure of macro texture, does not correspond with friction. Um, and that bothers me. Um, both of the, remember, both uh, sets of lab tests were done by the same group. So if there's an equipment issue, I don't know if it's an artifact or that, it may just be a true finding. Um, but that's, that's something that bothers me. Both of the studies suggested that the 130 spacers might have an advantage over the 110. But the thing I point out is the IgG field results really don't collaborate with that very well. So. That was about as fast as I can talk. If there's any questions, but what I'll point out, and I'm hoping I'm not lying to you because I took this picture many years ago, but I think that's an Arizona century cactus blooming, which you'd have to be around another 100 years to see. Actually, it blooms a lot more often than that, but I don't know why they call it that. But Any questions? Happy hour. Yes, sir. You have longitudinal grooving, and you have a device that's spinning in a circle. And so you're really measuring an average of the texture, not necessarily the longitudinal direction or the transverse. You're getting an average yeah. result. So I think that's part of the reason why they don't correlate well, either in the lab or even in the field, if you were to take a DFT to a texture that had one direction of grooving. Yeah, what, one of the studies that IGJ did, uh, one of the devices, friction devices, I didn't comment on because I was trying to shorten this up. California has a device called a CT342, 
it, it was developed in the late 50s. It's a really cool device in its day, but it's got a small tire and you coat it with glycerin. Okay, but what it allows, it's only six feet long. It's the only friction device that you can measure friction and angle. This is get whether you're talking about isotropic or anisotropic. When you have longitudinal grooving, you actually have an anisotropic surface. If you measure the friction and angle, what we found is friction on a longitudinally grooved surface will actually increase as you go away from it. The transverse that everybody likes is its maximum friction as the vehicle gets out of control, friction decreases. So I, I think you're right on. Um, so, any other questions or? Thank you very much.